Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for new morning and new mercies. We thank you for your blood, Lord Jesus, that washes us and cleanses us. And Father, above all, we ask you for the spirit of revelation to rest upon us. Lord, we just come humbly before your word, looking at the most glorious words in all of scripture, the words of God. And Lord, I just ask you to mark us, Jesus, as we uh, read through the book of John, that you would uh, meet us in the name of Jesus. We love you, God. We bless you and we honor you. Amen. Well, good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged. There's about 63, 65 of you guys getting on at 9 a.m. Through you, through you guys a curveball. And so, um, so it's good to see everybody jumping on and being able to shift with me. Um, I want to let you guys know what I'm thinking. First off, if you're wondering where we're going to start, we're going to start in uh, John 2. Yeah, it's 7 a.m. where you're at. Well, it's 9 a.m. here, so you're in West Coast time. Um, so, yeah, I want to just say thank you guys uh, for moving. I, I This is kind of what's in my mind as we're going forth. I know yesterday I was sharing with you kind of lots of changes at Upper Room and everything. This is what, I, what I'm going to commit to you guys is that we get through uh, the book of John. Um that we get through the book of John and that will be able to give us the four gospels. And so that's going to take another month because, <laughs> you know, John is, John trudges along. And so we're, we're going to, um, I'm going to commit that to you guys that we can get through uh, the book of John and then we'll probably transition into something else. I know uh, Corey Russell online, we've got some plans for this summer as far as looking at different books of the Bible and, and strengthening you in your life in prayer. And so you guys um, um, just stay tuned with that. So let's lock in for this month. Again, we're going to do 9 a.m. This is what I'm committing to you, 9 a.m. Monday to Thursday uh, until we get through the book of John. And then we'll make, we'll figure out what we're going to do. Yes. Will these be available? Yeah. You'll always get the recordings. Uh, we'll always send the recordings of everything that we do. And so anyway, I love you guys. I carry you in my heart and I want to take advantage of this season and just, you know what? I, I hate loose ends. So I'm all about finishing something. And so if we're going to start the book of John. Let's finish it. And so let's do it. Yeah. I want to do the book of revelation. With you. Yes, yes, yes. You know what? We just might do book of revelation another time. I, I, I know we got the major prophets, the minor prophets, um, we'll get there. And so, amen. Good, good, good. Um, so this is going to be with this nine o'clock is it's going to be tight. I'm going to probably be ending at around nine 58, uh, my time. So here in about 55 minutes, we're just going to get through it. If you, my, my desire for you is that you're reading along with me and that you're really coming with questions coming with insight. And so that we can go for it and that we're reading together. So today we'll probably look at John two and we're gonna get into John three and, uh, and then we'll go from there. So that blesses me. Great, great, great. Amen. So good, good, good. Yes, yes, yes it is. And so you guys track with us at Upper Room. We're doing, we did Revelation one, uh, Miller, uh, Michael and Larissa did uh, two and three. And then we're probably gonna hit four and five this week. Good. All right, so let's look at John 2. Yesterday, John 1 is absolutely loaded. And at the end of the day, my main desire is just to read through the Bible, highlight things, and provoke hunger and, and a desire for the spirit of revelation. Let's look at Jesus' first miracle, okay? On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. I've always loved that name, Cana. We almost named Trinity, my oldest daughter, Cana. I love that name. Um, so he's in the North and this is the, and, and what, I, and, and, and what's interesting about the book of John and all the other gospels, it starts off with Jesus's, it pretty much has Jesus going to, uh, through his, uh, baptism into the wilderness. And then his Galilean ministry begins, which is in the North. And Jesus is going to begin by calling Peter and, uh, Andrew and James and John, and he's calling them, but John one through four all happens 
before Jesus is, uh, before we see even the start of Jesus's Galilean ministry. So all these things are happening even before that. And we're about to see Jesus's launch of his ministry. So he's there and uh, there was a wedding in the Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Okay. And I look at this. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to them, they have no wine. <laughs> so Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. <laughs> First off, there's got to be some endearment to that word woman. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully it's, it's an affectionate term. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, with the way you read it in, in, in our Bibles, it just sounds so intense and rough. And I'm like, come on, take it easier. And uh, so he just says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? And look at this. My hour has not yet come. We see a couple of things right here. Number one, Jesus had not yet launched into ministry. He had not gone. It had not come for him to come forth. But you're about to see one of the most amazing verses in the Bible. That's exactly right. Look at this. And his mother said to his servants, whatever he says to you, do it. <laughs> it's almost like, and only a mother could do this. Only a mother. And, and what you're about to see, what you're about to see is that Jesus's ministry, though it wasn't the time, and this gives you insight into intercession, really, because we see that it's not the hour for Jesus to be launched into ministry. And Mary goes, yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. It is the hour for you to be launched into ministry. And he, she looks at the ones taking care of it. And, he, and she says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And there will be times that where you will think the will of God is this. And God will be saying, there is a place in the will of God. It's not just some sovereign time or just some set time that the power of intercession can hasten and actually accelerate the release of the will of God. And Mary, Mary it's just almost like she says, I'm the, I know you, boy. I know you, and you're going to do what I say, and whatever he tells you to do, do it. I just love it that Jesus's ministry was launched through his mother, okay? Now, there were six there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews. Okay. So we're going to see right here that the manner of purification of Jesus, that and it, that would be customary. They would have all these for the washing, cleansing, washing of hands, washing of uh, utensils, cups, and all that stuff. And that was customary for those days. And they were empty. Each one of these six water pots can, can contain 20 to 30 gallons of water. So Jesus told them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And then he said to them, now draw some of them out. And here's the operative word, now. That word, now. And take it to the master of the feast, which means move quickly. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he did not know where it came from. Okay. And then the master of the feast called the bridegroom and they said to them, every man at the beginning, you set out the good wine at the beginning. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. So this is the beginning of the signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed him. All right. There's several things that we can take away from this. Number one, Jesus' first <clears throat> meal is at a wedding. That the, the revelation of Jesus, the revelation, the manifestation of his glory happens at a wedding. And if you, we had time today, if we were only to make this the main theme of today, we could talk about the revelation of God as bridegroom. As God as bridegroom, the Bible begins with a wedding in the very beginning. In Genesis 2, we see, we see the bringing together of man and woman, the woman taken from Adam's side, and then the Lord brings Eve to Adam, 
and the two become one. The Bible begins with the wedding. And something that's very consistent throughout the whole word of God is the fact that God, Yahweh, is a bridegroom. He betroths himself to a nation, Israel. Exodus 19 and the receiving of the Ten Commandments and the law, though that's the marriage contract. I want you to see that the, the Ten Commandments and the establishment of the law is God's marriage contract and ceremony to the nation, saying, this is what I'll do, and this is what I desire for you. All the way through the prophets, Jeremiah, Hosea, Hosea is going to marry a prostitute as a statement of God's marriage to an unfaithful bride. Jesus is going to come, and we're going to see right here in the next chapter that John is going to call himself, the Baptist is going to call himself the friend of the bridegroom, and Jesus is the bridegroom. I think that's very prophetic, and, and, it's, and it's the Lord making a clear statement that he is the bridegroom. And then he's going to release the new wine at a wedding. He's going to release this wine at a wedding, and he's saving the best until last. There are so many prophetic um, uh, uh, themes that you could draw from. Even on a prophetic note, I felt like 2020, the Lord told me at the start of the year that he was going to turn water into wine in 2020. What I meant for that is I believe he's going to turn the tears that have been stored over the last 10 years and that the Lord is going to turn it into the wine of joy and laughter and uh, the, the romance of the gospel is going to touch the church again. We're going to fall in love with Jesus, the bridegroom. You know, Psalm 56 says that he stores our tears in the bottle. Psalm 56 says, store my tears in your bottle. And I believe there's, he's going to take the water and he's turning it to wine. And so the fact that he manifested his first miracle at a, at a wedding, and that was Jesus's coming out party, is very prophetic and insightful. We can come back to that with questions later. After this, he went down to Capernaum. And so we have Jesus, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and he did not stay there many days. So now we have something that you don't see in the other gospels. Look with me in verse 13. We're going to see... We're going to see um, Jesus do something in John that we don't see in the other recorded uh, Gospels. In the other recorded Gospels, we see Jesus cleansing the temple at the end of his ministry, okay? And that's something that he did, but John says he not only did it before he died, he did it at the beginning of his ministry. So John has him bookending his whole ministry in Jerusalem by the cleansing of the temple. Let's read this. So now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. So when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, poured out the changers money and overturned the tables. And this is what he says, take these things away. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Now, this is the thing that I want you to see. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. This is a quote from Psalm 69. Psalm 69, you need to go back and look at Psalm 69 later, but it's David's zeal for the house of God and the reproach that David had to bear for his zeal for the dwelling place of God. Yesterday, we looked at John 1.14, and it says that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And, and, and one of the other translations says that the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us, and that Jesus is the walking tabernacle. He is the walking ark of the glory of God. He is the walking ark, and he comes into the temple, and where the temple is the Holy of Holies has no ark in it. Jesus, as the ark, says, zeal for my house has consumed me. And he cleanses the temple in essence saying, it's time to get back to peer worship. It's time to get back to ministry to God. And I'm restoring the Holy of Holies back to it. 
And so I zeal for your house. If I believe that God, you know, we talk about pandemics out there and viruses. I have a prayer for you that a virus would lay hold of your life. And it's a virus called zeal for his house. Jesus, it literally says, it's eaten me up. It's eaten me up. And I, my prayer for you is that zeal for the dwelling place of God would eat you up. My goodness. Well, I love this. It, they do that and the disciples get revelation. That's insight right here when the Holy Spirit will, will speak a Bible verse to you. Look with me in verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Emily just asked, how do we have zeal and be love at the same time? I believe zeal is an expression of love. I believe zeal is an expression of love. It's so, you might mean zeal and compassion. That's a different question. I don't believe those are even exclusive. But, but the Lord, there will be different manifestations of the love of God and of the compassion, the tenderness, and the zeal. I believe we're so politically correct in the church in these days, and I believe that God wants to baptize a generation with zeal. It does seem harsh. However, it, it, it seems harsh if you're just looking at it from man's point of view. But I think about, you know, this is direct quotes from Jeremiah 7, uh, the den of thieves, Psalm 69. And when you see that, that people have turned what was meant for God into places, because this is what they were doing. The whole religious system was built upon getting money. It was a whole merchandise system. And it, what it was doing, it had nothing to do about ministry to God. It had to do about taking money and getting in the way between people and their longing for God and God. And Jesus was denouncing the religious system. And when that touches you, zeal. Zeal is that which breaks out against people that steal his glory. Let's keep reading right here. So Jesus does this. I mean, Jesus is fired up. That's exactly right. He's, these people are taking advantage during Passover. So what they are, they're a bunch. I don't know if you've ever been on, on gone to it, like been on a cruise or I never have, but, I, but, but if you've ever gone somewhere and you land on a new island and you got thousands of people trying to get your money, that's what all these people are trying to do. It's tourist money. And they're just sitting there trying to, to get everything from them. And they're stealing the very purpose of Passover, which is the washing away of sins and the connecting of people to God. Well, they said, by what sign do you do these things? What sign will you show to us that you do these things? And look at Jesus. Jesus's first prophecy is going to be his resurrection. And this is what he's gonna say, destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. Which means you will know that I have power and authority to cleanse this temple when you see me raised from the dead. When you see me raised from the dead, you will know that I am the messenger of the covenant. And I always think about Malachi 3 and 4 right here, where it says that the messenger of the covenant will come suddenly to his temple and he will purify the sons of Levi that they may offer an offering in righteousness. So he's coming as the messenger of the covenant saying, you wanna know by what authority I do this, what sign I do this, when I raise from the dead. And Jesus always says, that'll be your sign. That's why he says, as it was with Jonah, so it will be with the son of man. It's always about death and resurrection. Here we go. Well, they look at him and they go, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? What are you talking about? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered. Now, I want to encourage you with Bible reading. You can circle that word remembered uh, twice in John 2. You see it in verse uh, 17 and you see it in verse 22. And when you see two words like that spoken within a matter of five verses, we're seeing the move of the Holy Spirit right here, 
who's causing the disciples to uh, remember. The Holy Spirit touches your mind and makes Bible verses come alive and will remind you of events in the future. So John's writing this like in whatever, 90 AD. He writes the book of Revelation and the book of John in the same season. And so he's an old man and he's saying, they remembered then, uh, they remembered the temple when Jesus rose from the dead. Okay. Now look at verse 23. Verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Now, look at this phrase about Jesus. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Whoo! You're going to see this come up a lot in the book of John, is Jesus saying, I don't need man's witness on me. The only witness that he used as a man was John the Baptist. He goes, my father is the one that bears witness to me. We'll look at that in John 5, probably on Thursday. But Jesus is going to keep referring to, I am not looking for man's approval. I'm not looking for man's validation. I'm not looking for man's stamp. And I'm not looking for the religious stamp of approval on me and on my ministry. Jesus says, it says that he knew what was in man. And so that, that right there, I think, it gives us insight into the purity that Jesus walked in and the, uh, he, he refused to come in and try to get the boys club to love him and to validate him. He's going to get his witness from the father, which I think is quite uh, amazing. Now let's turn to John three. We'll most likely get through uh, maybe about the first half of John three today. We'll do the second half and four tomorrow, and then we'll probably do five on Thursday. We'll just see what happens, but just do our best. We're, I, I want to take my time. So this is what I said to you guys at the beginning. My, what I'm planning on doing is at 9 a.m. now, Monday to Thursday, beginning from here on out, I want to get through the book of John, which will take us about another month, and then we'll kind of reassess what we can do long term. And uh, we may make some transitions, but... The thing that I want to give Corey Russell, give to the, to, the, to the group is at least the four Gospels. And then we can look at specific books uh, along the way and, and do some of those things. All right, John 3. This is awesome. It, the book of John is, guys, it's just, my goodness. All right. <clears throat> there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to uh, Jesus by night and said to him, note, note the reality. So you've got, a, you've got a, a man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews, and look at the phrase, by night. See, there's not one wasted word in the Bible. So what, does, what, what, does, what can you infer by the, by the fact that this ruler of the Jews is going to come to Jesus by night? He's going to come in stealth. He's going to come in hidden. He's looking to protect his reputation and he's looking to shield off any, and he's creating plausible deniability. He goes, I don't know. I wasn't there. And he's going to come to Jesus and he's going to go rabbi, which it means teacher. So he's going to come in with the sense of, it sounds like he's coming in really respectful, but he's actually coming in, in a kind of alluring, um, sarcastic, um, I feel like he's baiting Jesus. You can see, and Jesus always cuts to the heart. You can tell that he's baiting Jesus by Jesus just cutting to the quick here in a second. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God's with him. For most of us, we go, hey, man, thank you. Hey, I appreciate that. Thanks. For, and, and, and this dude's buttering him up, and Jesus answered and said to him, he just cuts right to it and says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
you can tell right there that he is going to expose the flattery. He's going to, he's going to expose the, just the nice pompous language and the trying to alert Jesus. And Jesus is going to drop an amazing phrase on the planet. And right here is the statement, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, we're going to talk about that phrase. Now, I didn't even really get to look at this in John 1. But in John 1, and I'll just say it to you, it says in verse uh, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, look at this, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but being born of God. I just would encourage you to write that phrase down, being born of God. What does it mean to be born of God? That is a work. I'm, I'm in verse, I'm in 3.3. And where Jesus' first statement to Nicodemus, in essence, saying, Nicodemus, I can't even talk to you unless you're born again. You can't even understand what I'm saying unless you have experienced a rebirth, a spiritual birth. This is the language we want to use. I, I even would encourage you so many times we just say it, is he saved? Is he saved? Is he saved? Is he born again? <laughs> a born again is the phrase I like to use. I do believe salvation is a biblical term. We are, we were saved. We were saved. We are saved. We're, I like to say it this way. We were saved. Whenever day you came, you're born again experience. We're being saved. That's called sanctification. And we're going to be saved. That's called the return of Jesus and glorification. But being born again is what I want to talk about. Being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? See, I think he's just, he don't, he's, what are you talking about? He can't he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He goes, do I got to go as a grown man, go back into my mom's stomach and come back out? I think he's just belittling Jesus here. And Jesus, Jesus says, most assuredly, unless one is born, let me know. He says, unless one is born of water and spirit, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, I think that's a direct reference to Ezekiel 36 and the spiritual, the new covenant, and how he's gonna use water to sprinkle from the cleansing of sins, and he's gonna give them a new heart in which to know God, a heart of flesh. Water and spirit, I, it, it does. It's a simultaneous experience that happens by the born again experience. It's a, it's a simultaneous, but it's water and spirit. There's a cleansing dynamic, and there's a spirit, there's a, I like to call it, a new operating system shift. That which is born of flesh is flesh, which means you were born naturally. But what I'm talking to you is that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So everyone who is born of the Spirit. So I wanna to talk to you about being born of the Spirit. I want you to write down a couple of verses. 1 John 3, 9 and 1 John 5, 4. And again, you're gonna find it, when you get into the book of John, you wanna read John's epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and you wanna read the book of Revelation. Those, all those books go together. John wrote them all, okay? And he wrote them in a similar time at the end of his life. And the, the language of John 
he speaks into this phrase a lot, being born of God. In 1 John 3, 9, he says an amazing phrase. He who has been born of God does not sin, for God's seed remains in him. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this. If you've been truly born of God, you'll never be a successful sinner ever again. The fact you're born of God is that you're uncomfortable in sin. I remember trying to do some things after I got born again that I did easily before I got born again. And when I did it after I got born again, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> it's like there's somebody in there. there. There's a whole new operating system inside of me. There's a whole new reality that's happened. And, and that phrase of God's seed dwelling in you. Whoo. The word is literally the sperma seed of God. It's the, sper it's the seed that contains the DNA of God. And there is a supernatural moment that happens. For me, it was February 18th, 1997. Some of you were born before you can remember. The point isn't whether it was explosive or if it was a calm encounter. The same reality took place that in one supernatural moment, you pass from death to life, you were cleansed of your sins, and you experienced a rebirth, and the Spirit of God, God's seed, came to live on the inside of you. You experienced a born-again experience. I talk about this in my Glory Within book. Maybe you guys have never read this. I wrote a book called Glory Within, The Interior Life and the Power of Speaking in Tongues. The main point is not the, though the, the, the back half is about the, the power of speaking in tongues, it's mostly about what it means to be born of God. What it means to have God's seed dwelling on the inside of you. I like to think of it this way. I like to think of it this way. If you were to look at me and then look at my dad, you can look, if you grew up in my hometown in Arkansas, you can look at me, my dad, my grandfather, my brother, and you can go, that's a Russell. <laughs> that's a Russell. Why? What, what lets you know that that's a Russell? You can see certain, uh, uh, you, can see, you can see realities like my nose and my ear. And these Russells have these lines right here in their smile. I have the same mannerisms as my dad. I have the same mannerisms. As my grandfather, I can look at pictures. What is that? It's DNA. It's the seed that's in the Russell family that takes on the traits of the Russell reality. Friend, you have received the DNA of God. You have now experienced a whole new transformation. There's the anointing. <laughs> and as you tend that seed, you're going to start looking like God. You're going to start talking like God. Act, that is inside of you already, and that's what you want to do. You want to read your Bible. Eternity becomes real. Being kind to people is the work of God in you. Patience, it's the work of God within you. And so John is, John, Jesus is telling Nicodemus, we can't even talk until you're born again so that you can even understand what I'm talking about. Eternity was not even real to me until I was born again. Jesus wasn't even real until I was born again. The longing to please God was not even, God is a real person was never real until I was born again. Why? Because I became his child through that born again experience. Now there's this phrase that says, Jesus says, the wind blows where it wishes. This is kind of a little cryptic little thing right here. The wind blows where it wishes. Uh, uh, 
Now, I believe that Elizabeth just asked, why do people struggle with kindness or wanting to read the Bible? Are they not truly born of God? No, I believe that, I believe you've got to tend the seed. I believe you've got to develop the seed. You can stay a two-day-old Christian forever, and I believe that can get buried and that you can live a life according to the flesh. That's why, uh, and again, you can get glory within on that, but, but my biggest thing is learning how to sow to the Spirit. You sow and you feed the seed. You, can, you feed the seed and you take on the traits of your dad. That's exactly right. That's exactly right, Justin. It's about the renewal of your mind. Because if you feed your flesh, that thing will override and you'll stay a two-day-old Christian forever. All right, here we go. What's this mean? The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who's born in the spirit. Nobody can see wind. How do you know wind's going on? How do you know there's wind? That's exactly right. You feel it. You hear it. You sense it. You know it. Jesus says, you want to know how those who are born of the Spirit? You can just tell who's been born of the Spirit. You can feel it when they talk. You can see it in their eyes. You can't discern where it comes from and where it goes or how it happened, but they transferred into a new place. Jesus. Nicodemus goes, how can these things be? Now, get your seatbelt on, guys. Jesus is about, to, is about to put the whole world on notice right here. Everyone lock in with me right here. This is amazing. Jesus says, are you the teacher of Israel? Now he's got Nicodemus backed into a corner. Nicodemus came interviewing Jesus, and Jesus goes, actually, you're, you're on trial, and we're interviewing you. He goes, are you the teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we. Now, now look at this. Earlier, Nicodemus said, we know that you're a teacher come from God. So he was representing the Pharisees, but Jesus is representing a we. Who's Jesus representing? He's representing the Father and the Spirit. And he goes, we speak what we know, and we testify what we've seen, but you do not receive our witness. Now, get your seatbelt on. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe them, how will you believe it if I begin to tell you heavenly things? He goes, dude, this is kindergarten. If you don't understand kindergarten, how about I unpack calculus on you? Now, get your seatbelt on for this one. No one, guys, look at verse 13. This is one of the, the wildest verses in the Bible. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And what Jesus is saying, that's exactly right, Janice. He's in both places at once. Jesus says, you know what? I, you can't go up till you come down. And right now, I'm in heaven. He goes, let's read this again. No one has ascended to heaven. And he's speaking in present about something in future. He goes, I can't go up until I've come down. But I want you to know that right now, the Son of Man is in heaven. Part of the, the born-again experience is this. And this is what Pauline Apollo, this is what Paul's theology is all about. That is that the moment you're born again, you're raised with Christ. Your spirit is with the Father in heaven. Okay? We have been raised and seated together with him in heavenly places. We have been given access in our spirits are born from above. 
We're children. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're children of heaven, but yet we're in earthly bodies here. So the spirit of God within you is the only way I can try to connect it is that there's a connector point between my spirit and, 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 and the reality of my heavenly reality. And my job is to renew my mind. Colossians 3, guys, this is really Bible verses. Some of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about? Colossians 3, Jesus says, if you've been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. He says, set your mind on things above where Christ is. And he says this phrase, look at this, you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then we will appear with him in glory. Jesus is looking at Nicodemus. Guys, this is crazy. And he says, I'm in heaven right now. <laughs> and Nicodemus goes, what you talking about, Willis? He goes, I don't understand what you're saying. Look at this. He says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, y'all remember that story in Numbers, they were being bitten by the serpents, and the Lord told Moses to put a serpent up, on, up, hang it up, and that everyone who looks on the serpent would be healed. And because the point was is that curse, the curse would come upon the serpent, and that they would be healed in seeing it. And Jesus is going to take that wilderness story to say in the same way you looked on the serpent and was healed, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then the verse of all verses, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'll just stop right there. Jesus is going to launch with Nicodemus, talking about being born again, seeing G and now he's giving us the way in which we're born again, believing that when Jesus is lifted up and we put our faith in him, we experience this born again experience. And, and he's going to say, whoever believes on him would have eternal life. And for God, who so loved the world, gave his only begotten son. People ask, what does it mean that Jesus is the only begotten? What does that mean? Rabbits beget rabbits. Birds beget birds. Humans beget humans. But God begets God. And it's a human analogy of an incomprehensible mystery of God begotting God and that Jesus is the son of God. And he is the glorious one. He's of the very own nature of the father. Him and the father are one. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking too. This is in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. That's okay. But then the mind blowing and the word was God. So he's distinct, but he's one with him. We will get into, it says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world, but that the world through him might be saved. All right, good. John is so dense and so intense. Every phrase is worthy of years, decades, centuries of meditation. I think I want to stop right there because we're going to be getting into the condemnation tomorrow and we'll roll into four uh, tomorrow. Questions on the things we've talked about, comments, anything that you would want to tease out some more. I had a question. Um, yes. So it's interesting. Maybe I should wait till tomorrow when we get into condemnation. But um, like, so this like John three sixteen. it's like the salvation verse, right? Um, yes. like, and it just says like, whoever 
believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I feel like I, like, I love that. And I know it's true and stuff, but I feel like sometimes like we've been, my husband and I, like, we've been looking for a church for like ever. It feels like since we moved and, um, we were going to one for a while and it was like, every time they did the altar call, they never like, I don't know, like there was never a mention of repentance. You know what I mean? It was just like, believe and accept. And I'm like, I don't know, like, are they, <laughs> are they missing half of it? Like, you know what I mean? Cause I kind of feel like it was like, that was kind of the deal breaker for us, you know? Cause we were like, Oh, maybe it was just this time. And then we got plugged into a small group and it was, um, I was, I, I brought it up, you know, um, we had like dinner with the pastors and they were like, Oh, you know, like we never really got to, like a good answer of like, why, why that's not, you know what I mean? Like, we just felt like it was like, like people were only being. Why isn't repentance preceding salvation? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I believe it. It's both. It's repent and be saved. It's repent and, and the work of repentance. I believe that in the born again experience, a true born again experience is preceded by repentance a deep breaking and turning and removal from your former life into that. And yeah, I think we've got to bring it back to our preaching. We got to preach repentance. We got to preach conviction of sins, but, but this is what I want. This is what I care about too in our altar calls that we not just that we understand it's a work of God. It's a work of God for the born again experience. It's, it's God working in the soul and there's not the acquiring of good enough morality or trying hard enough or having the right formula or saying the right prayer, but it's a work of faith in the heart that reaches for God. And we experience that's exactly right. Lindsay, the greatest miracle. Right. I, I say this often. And again, I'll say it to you guys again, glory within. I wrote a book in 2011 called glory within. And I say that the greatest miracle is not blind eyes open, deaf ears open, dead raised. It's God taking up his very own substance and in one supernatural moment, infusing his divine DNA into our dead spirit and we being born again and God taking up residence on the inside. Hey. Now for me, <clears throat> yes, I imagine the books on Amazon. Now, for me, I was a 20-year-old strung out drug addict. But you, you might have been a five-year-old little girl who felt the badness of your heart and you came up to the front. The same miracle took place regardless of the light show or the explosion or the emotions. It's a work of God. And so the same miracle took place. It's about that that we want to build it on. Amen. Amen.